we're going to be looking over the next few weeks. Um, we'll be taking a break at the end of February, and we've got Joff Hunt, the regional minister, new team leader, coming and spending a day with us. But we're going to be looking at this series called Growing More Like Jesus through the lens of Galatians 5, 22 to 23, really exploring the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and under the whole kind of banner, really, uh, of what does it mean for us to grow in our relationship with God and how is that then outworked as a church and into this community, how are we taking hold of these truths of God and asking that question, are they really evident in our lives? Or are they things maybe that we've, well, we've learned when we're children and that sort of thing, but actually we kind of don't see this really as that relevant or really that important to really dig into? And I don't know about you, um, but, but I, I love fruit. Um, I, you know, nothing more I'd love the, for breakfast, uh, not this time of year, but to have a bowl of fruit um, once it warms up. At the moment, it's kind of porridge season for me. Um, but once it warms up, um, I'll happily have kind of go to would be a banana, an apple, satsuma, um, maybe some grapes. Um, and then depending if there's other things on offer, you might kind of, you know, venture out a little bit. Um, flat peaches, uh, well, something I quite fancy, a um, bit of a, a persimmon or Sharon fruit. Uh, maybe a few raspberries, strawberries, obviously, if the garden's offering them as well, that sort of thing. Point is, this language of fruit that we read about in Galatians 5, I think can actually sometimes mislead us. I think actually, as we look at this passage, it can sometimes cause us to, to miss what is actually being said here. Or rather, I think it can throw us off course, if you will. Um, what I mean by that is, obviously, we have different fruits grow on different trees, don't they? Um, so it's the idea that you have a banana plant, you expect to find bananas on it. Um, hopefully this is not revolutionary for you. Um, if you have an orange tree, you hope to get oranges on it. Yes, uh, and so on and so forth. You, you don't naturally get different fruit growing on the same tree or plant. Now we have these nine attributes that are listed here by Paul Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, good kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, you may recall uh, back in lockdown, um, Ian and Ella recorded a, fi- uh, a song all about the fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. Um, maybe you'll be trying to forget that now. I've just reminded you of that fact. Um, the point is, we have these nine attributes here, okay, uh, these fruits that we read about in Galatians 5. And I'm guessing at some point, when we've looked at this, whether it was when we were much younger or, or that's it, the image of fruit, so it's kind of bananas, oranges, those things, are kind of put alongside it, or they come to mind. And the danger, I think, here is that we can therefore think, well, these are nine different fruits that Paul is talking about, Um, which in turn might lead us to think, well, actually, there's a bit of pick and mix that can go on here, um, because actually, I don't really like bananas, um, or I'm not really that much a fan of oranges. And in the same way, I can look at these nine attributes and go, well, these are the ones that I really want to emphasize. These are the ones that I really feel I've, I've got a bit of chance with. Those ones, well, maybe we'll just kind of leave them uh, to one side. But if you look in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it reminds us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They are all fruit of one tree, to use the horticultural kind of illustration here. They are fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruits of the Spirit that Paul is talking about. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But furthermore, he goes on in verse 28, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, if we're seeking to follow Jesus, to grow more like him, then these are the characteristics that should be seen in us. They should be evident in the person that I am, in the life that I'm living, the choices that I'm making, the places I'm going, the people I'm connecting with, and how I'm carrying myself through life. And they should be things that I'm eagerly seeking after and to grow in more and more each day. So today we're going to begin, rather unsurprisingly, um, with love. And just explore a little bit of what that might mean for us in this context. I don't know where we might start. You know, it used to be the thing you'd go to the dictionary and look for the definition. Um, I think these days it's you go to Google, isn't it? And you Google love. I did that the other day with 16.07 billion results. 
Um, and that was just, it told me, in 0.49 seconds. Um, but we're not going to go there. Um, but there is a load of different ideas of what we might think of love, what the world might say to us about love, what we should or shouldn't uh, reflect on. We're going to look uh, in the Bible. We're going to go to 1 John 4. I invite you to turn with me or, or turn it on. 1 John and chapter 4. I'm going to read from verse 7. Um, in the NIV entitled God's Love and Ours. John, 1 John 4. Reading from verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we all have confidence on the day of judgment in this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this commandment. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Whew. I don't know about you, but reading that through, and, and it was one of those passages you've got to kind of concentrate um, because it's kind of it's saying this is love and God is love and you're not love and, and love and love and love and love. As I read it through preparing for today and even just reading it through there, there's just, I can only describe it almost my mind just wants to go, really, um, because of what is actually being talked about here. And there is that kind of the, the pattern and the, the style uh, of the writing here. Um, but there's so much more. I mean, we're just looking at 15 verses uh, of this letter from John. Um, but if you actually explore the letter, what he's saying, the depth to which he's going, um, he is, I don't know, he's, he's up to bat and he is going to give it some welly. Um, he's not going to stand there idly and just say a few nice pleasantries and that sort of thing. In terms of the background and the scene here, it's obviously John's first letter that we read in the New Testament. It's being sent to a local church who faced division and upset, and he's seeking to, to stabilize the situation, if you will. He's seeking to input into some of the, the disagreements and some of the, the challenges that they're facing. And so he writes a great deal about love. These verses uh, are not all that he says about love uh, in this letter, but he's also emphasizing the fact that there's the need for belief to be matched by action. It needs to be outworked in our lives. And just to be clear, when we say John, uh, this is John, the son of Zebedee, the beloved disciples, the author of the fourth uh, gospel. It's interesting, uh, the commentator uh, Clifton Black, he suggests referring to these verses, he says, here we journey into the most profound analysis of Christian love in the New Testament, surpassing, he would suggest, even the better known 1 Corinthians 13. That's the, the passage that begins, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, uh, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He'd suggest, you know, what actually is here in these verses it is of even greater kind of significance, if you will. I mean, the NIV heading that I, I referenced, God's love and ours. I personally prefer one I came across uh, in another translation. It says, our, as God's children, we are to reflect God's character. 
That's what this section is about. As God's children, we are to reflect God's character. And as I said, there's something I think really powerful in the way these words have been put together. There's a a rhythm, there's a, a flow to John's words. And the way that love just kind of repeatedly tumbles out. Uh, I almost had that kind of image of like a waterfall, you know, it just is continually coming out. There's more to it. There's more to be explored. Uh, The vastness of what is being uh, set before us here. And so as we work through these verses, you find actually also there's kind of layer upon layer. Uh, that builds upon one another in terms of what God uh, has for us. And so I want us to reflect on three thoughts that I came across as I was exploring this uh, passage this week, which I think will hopefully help us unpack both what he's saying here, but also what impact should it have in, in our lives. So initially, it's looking at how God's love is presented to us how God's love is presented to us. Uh, There are two verses in particular that I think respond to this question. Uh, Verse 10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Both of these verses, they show the initiative of God. You know, there's that age-old question, you know, who shot first? Um, the greater question, though, uh, and the one that's relevant to this passage, is who loved first? And the answer is very clearly uh, and decisively, God loved first. You might kind of say, but hold on a second, why is, why is that that important to clarify that? Or more to the sense, kind of, it's not obvious, really, kind of, we, we know that. We know that in the beginning was God and all those sort of things. I wonder if we need to sometimes remember the fact that that this reminds us that God is not passive. He didn't just sit back uh, and let us figure out this sin problem all by ourselves. No, he he took an active role in our redemption. And I wonder whether sometimes we can miss that, maybe because we've kind of grown up through uh, the church or in terms of exploring faith, or it's something that we've kind of experienced for many, many years. But if we look back at the beginning of the Bible, some of the events and characters there. You know, you take Noah and the ark, for example. Who initiates there? It's God. Look at Abraham uh, and the covenant. Who initiates there? Again, it's God. Uh, Moses and the burning bush. Once again, it's God who takes the initiative and meets with his people. God is always the one on the front foot. Uh, He's the one continually taking the initiative. And this is a pattern that we see as it goes throughout the Old Testament uh, into the New, where obviously at that point it kind of takes a monumental step forward when that initiative is seen through sending Jesus and his sacrificial work on the cross. But it's that reminder to us that God loved first, which leads us to how God's love was displayed through Jesus. Here, verse 9 of 1 John 4, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. It's displayed through the the death uh, of Jesus. Um, Without the resurrection, it's just a death, but it's through the death, that willingness to give up his son in our place. That's the love of God. That's what we're going to celebrate a bit later on uh, in communion. That atoning death that paid the price, that led to our forgiveness of sin. I mean, another well-known verse from John's pen that might come to mind is John 3.16, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his one and only, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The thing again, though, that I think just ramps this up, that turns it up to 11, if you will, um, is just the extravagance of what God is doing. You know, God was under no obligation to send Jesus. There's no kind of part that he kind of had to do this. And again, I wonder whether that's something that we kind of sometimes miss. Maybe sometimes we become so blasé with it um, that actually it was his choice. It's asking that question, how does that feed in to my life? God was under no obligation. He didn't have to send Jesus, but he chose to willingly 
for you and for me. He took the initiative. He loved first. And he did it even for people who may not ever love him back. I'm guessing the majority of here, us here this morning, and maybe people tuning in, uh, we've responded to that love. We've received that love, and we're seeking to love God back. But God didn't kind of, when he sent Jesus, said, well, you're only dying for those who are going to kind of commit and follow me. Uh, you know, you're only coming for those who are going to kind of respond. But the rest of them, no, you, you're not, you know, it's kind of limited. Really. None of that. No, Jesus' death was for all whether we choose to respond and love him back or not. So God loved first. He was under no obligation. But because of his compassion, God's love transforms and changes us. You know, God's love is it's like nothing else. Talked about whether we could, you know, Google what love is. And I'm sure you could do that thing. You could go around and say, what well, comes to mind when you think of the word love? And we'd have a whole myriad of different answers and thoughts and reflections and that sort of thing. The reality is there's no kind of greeting card slogan, no, you know, box of chocolates, uh, no earthly comparison that we can actually make to the love of God. It's something that is beyond even our comprehension. But the impact that it can have is something that is very real world, uh, is very down to earth, is very much something uh, that can seep into and impact every part of our lives. You know, the passage uh, in 1 John 4, verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Um, Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And then verse 20, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You know, God's love is not a passive love. And in the same way, God's love does not act passively in us. If we've received God's love, if we're seeking to live for him, there needs to be that impact, that difference that is made. It needs to transform and change us. And this passage, you know, it talks about how uh, it works in us to love one another, to care for our brother and sister, um, giving us that confidence as we move forward in whatever happens. And ultimately, verse 17 transforms us to be more like Jesus. And so I want to pose two questions this morning. Firstly, you know, have we received God's love? Is it something that actually we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Because if we haven't, then I want to ask the question, is today that day? Is today that opportunity, that moment when we say yes to following Jesus, deciding to live for him? Uh, wherever Jesus will lead us, that's where we will seek to go. And if that's you this morning, then I want to encourage you, don't leave here today without talking to someone, saying, yeah, actually, I want to do something about this. And if you're watching online, um, and maybe that's something that sparked with you, uh, then get in touch. Um, Send us a message. Email the church. Don't think, oh, well, this is maybe something I should do something about, but I'll put it off till another time. Because the reality is another time may not come. Second question that I want to pose, though, and and I can't speak for you, but I'll be honest, there are some people who I struggle to love in life. Maybe that might come as a shock to you. Uh, But in all seriousness, isn't it? There are people, I was thinking about this week, and you go down a rabbit hole if you're not careful. There are people that wind me up. There are people who annoy me. There are people who frustrate me, and there are some people who just make me angry. And I'm sure if we're honest, actually, we could in the same way think of those people who actually we would very happily cross over the road from, maybe literally, because we don't really want to have to encounter them. There are those people who, whenever we come across them, they just rub us up the wrong way. And actually, we think very little positive about them. You know, whatever it is for us, 
I think the reality is there will be those people who we struggle to love in life. If we take the truth of this passage, though, I feel the challenge that if God was willing to take the initiative to love and to sacrifice his son, Jesus, for these people, those that you're thinking of at this moment, that maybe you wouldn't speak out loud, those that I'm thinking of, that I'm not going to say out loud. If God was willing to take the initiative to love them, to give his son, Jesus, over for them, then surely I can go out of my way and put myself out to try and love them also. I'm not saying that's easy. Um, I'm not saying that's always going to be reciprocated. Um, And I'm not standing here as someone who's got it all sorted. But I believe actually this is where the fruit of the Spirit needs to be outworked in our lives. And I wonder whether sometimes we look at some of these verses, such as Galatians 5, and we go, that's a great verse for children, isn't it? It's the kind of thing they need to learn. Yeah, Tim and the team, they should really be touching on these sort of things. But actually, there's more important things for us as adults to look at. There's more essential things that we need to be grappling with, where I think actually sometimes the very simplest supposed verses, we've moved over because the challenge is actually quite great. I believe God's love transforms and changes us. The choice is where we take this from here. And maybe for you as you sit there and as I reflect on this, maybe it's taking the initiative to love that friend who maybe is going through some kind of mental health challenge or life situation um, that just has gone on and on and on. And actually we've got to that point where I just, I don't, just fed up with it. Maybe it's taken the initiative with our neighbor who actually has annoyed us and stressed us out uh, and been rude to us. And I'm not saying that we've suddenly got to try and, you know, go over the top and become best buddies with them, but actually don't know how can I respond in this situation that is going to glorify Jesus. Maybe it's taken the initiative with those who have different political views to us or views on certain issues. And where is it so easy just to come at them and go, actually, well, no, you're wrong. I've got this other opinion. I want to tell you about my point. Actually, because you're shouting at me, I'm going to shout back at you and go, no, how can I respond with love in this situation? Maybe it's taken the initiative of thinking, how can I love that colleague who every day they turn up and they just stink of body odor. Because this is real world stuff. And actually, it may be something that we see on a, a massive level. It may be something that's really just mundane and annoying. But in every situation, the response we need to be taking as followers of Jesus is to say, how can I love the people around us? Those people that wind me up those people that annoy me, those people that frustrate me, those people that anger me. And how, not because of an obligation, but because of God's love for me, can my be response of one of saying, how can I love those around me? You know, if we're seeking to follow Jesus, if we're endeavoring to serve God, you know, who decided to take the initiative to love you and to love me, then I pray that will change us, that will transform us, that that will do something in us that causes us to take the initiative on our own. Let me pray. Lord, I want to thank you for the truth that we read in your word, and I pray that the truth that comes from you will be that which we are challenged by, that we cling on to, and that all else we will just let fall away. And for us this morning, Lord, as we reflect on what does it mean to really love the world around us, I pray you'll help us to to ask that question of what does this mean in my situation? What does this mean if I'm really going to take this seriously? What does this mean as we long to follow you and be a witness to the world around us? By your grace, will you continue to love us? And by your Holy Spirit, will you empower us to serve you, Lord?